Okay, uh, my name is Will Brindley. I work at the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. And I've been looking for most of the last year at dynamic cables and floating wind in particular. I'm going to be talking about the uh, test rig we have to test these cables, uh, particularly for fatigue, and a model that we've built to replicate the test rig. <clears throat> so this is what we we're talking about with floating wind. So you've got floating turbines, in this case, 15 megawatt semi-submersibles. You've got about 30 of them, so half a gigawatt of power. And they are connected to the seabed with mooring lines and these cables with lazy waves. Um, and in what we expect to be fairly typical radial type array, each turbine will have a cable going in and a cable going out. And what we're trying to model is making sure these last for 20, 30, 40 years in a very dynamic offshore environment. Um, so the projections that the floating wind uh, that Paul just talked about um, at a very high level. Um, before floating wind kicked off, we have some quite good experience from oil and gas. <clears throat> so about 20, 30 years of experience on medium voltage and high voltage power cables or umbilicals. And it's maybe about 50 of those cables that we can learn from as an industry and refine those designs. And then in the last few years, we've had quite a steep ramp up of floating wind, of course, about 100 megawatts to date. Um, and that makes up about 20 something cables, relatively small turbines, five megawatts. But over the next uh, 10 years, we expect that to increase by five or 10 times. So now we'll have in 10 years time, 150 dynamic cables. Uh, much larger turbines, larger motions, and hopefully we'll have that design refined and lessons learned. <clears throat> and we'll need to learn from those designs uh, and test properly because we project by 2050 that uh, 50 gigawatts of floating wind, which means 3,000 dynamic cables. So if we don't have that design right and they fail um, anything close to the rate that we see for static wind, uh, we'll have a serious problem. So it's really important that we design these right. And where we're coming in is also testing these cables uh, for the biggest concern um, in a dynamic environment, which is fatigue. Uh, so this is what we're looking at. So we've got the top side with a turbine on the right there. And then that translates down to our um, cables. In, in this case, with a tethered lazy wave configuration. It's not an optimized configuration, but it shows you in a fairly extreme storm, what uh, these power cables are likely to see. So you've got an upwind cable which stretches. Um, particular concern is this downwind cable, which sees quite a lot of curvature. Um, and that curvature uh, and the curvature cycles uh, gives very large bending strains in the components. And that's really what we're trying to test in our test rig. Um, so going out to in on the component, we've got the outer sheath. Um, you're in a floating environment, so the cable's going up and down on the seabed, and that can, over many years, abrade the sheath and then cause failure. And certainly in oil and gas, we've seen issues with sheath damage from fishing, but also how the, the sheath interface with the, the vessel as well. And then going into the cable, um, when you cycle a component, the thing that really suffers is the metallic components through fatigue cracking. The component that sees the largest level of strain because it's on the outside is the armor wire. Uh, so steel, particularly if it's not well corrosion protected, uh, could be at risk from fatigue cracking. Um, but certainly what we've seen uh, from our tests, but also the data published in, in the industry, is the highest risk component are these copper wires, um, particularly the screen wires and the copper cores. Um, because when they cross over each other, you get this kind of fretting effect where you have a crack initiation site. And that crack can quite easily propagate and cause failure, and that's what we're seeing. So the design of those copper cores um, is important. And the other thing that affects the, the behavior of the cable is temperature. So power cables, lots of current, current heats up the cable. When the cable gets hot, it gets less stiff uh, because of how the polymers behave. So then you get higher curvatures on the components. And some data indicates also for copper that you have about 10 times higher fatigue damage when it's hot as well. So there's an interesting coupling there between thermal and mechanical stress. And the other thing that um, doesn't do well when it's hot is insulation. So designing insulation to um, 
behave well and making sure it doesn't overheat um, would be a big challenge, particularly when you've got big bend stiffeners uh, and the cable as it goes into the vessel where it might be quite well insulated. And the other area of research we're looking at is also insulation, water tree growth and electrical tree growth. And it's not fully understood how that interacts with the mechanical strain that the insulation is gonna see in a dynamic cable. So to make sure that our cables are good for the, this kind of service over the long term, you need to test the cables. Um, the current standard for, for certainly large high voltage or medium voltage power cables is this Segra TB62 re standard. Um, and typically for a fully completed cable, you only have to run one test and you run a range of curvatures to capture the response that you see in reality. Um, the problem with this test is that you only really can confirm a failure when you cut into the cable structurally. Um, so sometimes it'll tell you you have a failure or hopefully when you run to the end of the test and you cut in, there'll be no damage and you say there's no failure. That doesn't really tell you very much about how, the, how good the cable is in fatigue and how it, how it performs relative to other designs. Um, so if you look for other standards like the DNV F401 standard, they actually ask for 15 tests. So you can start to characterize uh, the stochastic nature of fatigue and actually get a better understanding of how these components fatigue. Uh, and I think that's particularly important for the individual power cores um, because they're quite a complex construction. There's a lot that could go wrong, particularly with the copper. So getting a good fatigue curve on those is gonna be very important going forward. And I think there's an opportunity here for a large scale testing program where we can really learn how these components behave. And it's not just a single supplier that benefits, but the whole industry can benefit. Uh, this is our test rig anyway. So you've got the arms move up and down in a sinusoidal manner. Uh, it goes over a fixed former, in this case, three and a half meters, which matches that three meter bend radius we saw in the storm for a real cable. Um, and we have got a time history feed of force and tension and pivot angle. So we can process that data. And the cables are terminated at the ends by this clampy interface, which I'll talk about a bit more. And what we're trying to replicate is what's happening on a real turbine. So this is a fairly extreme example, quite high waves, um, a lot of curvature, but it does show you how much uh, a cable is gonna work in a dynamic environment for a very long time. So this will give you one case that you have to test. Uh, and that's what we've got in a test rig here. So the arms go down and to the maximum. And then we've got an Orcaflex model of that same test rig. And the purpose of the Orcaflex model is it helps us understand how the cable's behaving, how it's straining, um, so we can actually optimize the test uh, to match reality. Orcaflex is a marine dynamic software Usually you use it for offshore vessel operations or floating operations, but it works quite well in a, in a factory setting. It works well with anything that's bendy, essentially. And that's all we're trying to do in a test rig is, is bend something uh, lots of times. And the end terminations here, we've got, um, we clamp the cable. So we apply some pressure to the cable and that stops it slipping under a, a sort of moderate tension around a ton. And luckily, these cables are quite light. And certainly in the near term, we're looking at fairly shallow water. So 100 meters, 200 meters water depth. Tensions are in the order of one to five tons. Um, so we can reasonably well replicate the tensions that we need. If you want to go for higher tensions, that's possible. But you'd have to take the armors, what armor wires out and clamp them as you do in a cable um, end termination. And just the anatomy of the test rig here, we've got some load cells which measure tensile and um, transverse loads. We've got displacement transducers to measure uh, accurate strains. And then there's a tensioning piston to maintain that tension as well. And all that's replicated in the Orcaflex model. So on the left Orcaflex model, right reality, we have a digital twin. We're bending the cable and the model allows us to understand the curvature. And the nice thing about Orcaflex, you can also input uh, non-linear stress drain curves and frictional behavior as well. So you can understand how friction is going to have an influence on the cable response and get um, through some post-processing, 
uh, get the actual strains in each individual component, each armor wire or cable core. Uh, and that's the nonlinear stick split type stress strain recurve, where the armor wires, um, due to the helical nature when you tension up, but also due to the sheath shrinking when you actually um, form that over the, the cable, those armor wires tend to stick through friction to the inner layer. And that gives you quite a stiff bending response. And then when you get over that frictional um, threshold and the arm wires start to slip, you get a, a lower bending stiffness. So that's quite important to the, the fatigue of the components. And then through measuring the response to the test rig, you can compare that with our models to see how well your models match reality. So that's basically an overview of the digital twin of our test rig. Looking forward, what else are we going to do with this test rig? Well, a big question, particularly in a pilot project where you're trying to learn as much as possible, is monitoring cable performance, particularly cable strain. Um, there's a number of projects looking at monitoring cable strain through fiber optic sensing. Um, and there's a question about how feasible that is and how accurately you can model cable strain. Uh, so that the test rig and having this system would allow you to check that these the strain monitoring is robust and reliable over 20, 30 years. Uh, we're also looking at the interface um, or the insulation with electrical and thermal stresses. Um, so through some academic projects, so we're testing a cable on a test rig, applying a current uh, with a known electrical tree defect and seeing how that grows with and without strain. Um, particularly of interest for high voltage cables um, where we don't really know how they can perform dynamically. Um, and in some, on the bottom right there, uh, quite a novel technology, looking at 3D printing the piezoelectric sensors um, to pick up partial discharge, uh, insulation problems uh, at low cost and potentially high sensitivity as well. So there's lots of things that we can test on the test rig. Uh, and in general, the look ahead is we'd like to see uh, a large scale test program. Um, so we can learn as much as possible about these cables before there's thousands of them out there. Um, but also the problem about how do you know a component's failed in your cable without cutting it? Well, there's some technology from oil and gas that we'd like to test um, to see if you can detect things like armor wire failure through eddy current. That's what's on the, the top right there. Um, for a riser, you can detect that uh, corrosion and fatigue, so you should be able to do it for a power cable. And then at the bottom, we talked a lot about power cables, but what's definitely coming is hydrogen, uh, potentially offshore production of hydrogen, and how do you get that hydrogen back offshore? We're well, going to need a, either a dynamic hydrogen riser or a combined power and hydrogen umbilical, and those all need to be analysed, designed, and tested as well. And another potential far horizon thing is, is high temperature superconducting cables. We're working on a project with supernode on these cables. Um, and that's looking at as an alternative to DC for a very high volume of power transmission over long distances uh, with zero losses. So there's lots of areas where our test rig and this kind of digital twin approach could, could be used to really understand how these perform for floating wind. Uh, that's the end of my presentation, thank you. Thank you for an interesting presentation and also for keeping time. Uh, so I see we have one question immediately from the audience here in Amsterdam. So it's Arne von Winninger from Fraunhofer. Yes, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Now, um, I'm not sure how, if you are a very patient kind of person, but um, Normally, people don't really want to wait 20 years for the results of a uh, test. So if you do a normal test, like on a blade or something, you would use an accelerated uh, test using, you know, SN curves, Palmer minor laws, etc., to uh, speed up things a little bit. Can you actually, do you have something like an SN line for, uh, for those dynamic cables? Do you know that, you know, if I up the strain by uh, 10%, I can uh, decrease the number of cycles by 30% or whatever? 
Uh, yeah, I guess accelerated testing is, is certainly possible. Um, we're seeing some challenge from some of the bigger industry players on how much you can believe the accelerated testing results. I mean, certainly the one and a half million cycles that Seagre requires, uh, that is challenging. You're certainly talking about two or three months to perform that if everything goes well with the rig. And if, if you have any problems, obviously that takes longer. Um, so, I mean, the other alternative is to cycle faster. Uh, so do more cycles per second. Uh, but the challenge there that we've seen is you tend to cook your cable because of all this frictional behavior that the cables overheat. Um, so one of the lessons learned is when you design these systems, it's quite nice to have a, some kind of cooling system built in uh, so you can push that forward. Uh, so yeah, it's possible to do accelerated testing um, by upping the strain levels, but because of this very complex stick-slip behavior, um, there is a risk that your, your, your bending and your curvature isn't going to be representative of what's going to see. Um, and there's a risk that you're going to extrapolate where you shouldn't. Um, so I think potentially doing it right and taking longer, at least in early days, is, is the way to go. Okay. Yes, thank you. I hear you. And then, of course, there's all the electrical, thermal, and what, ha what have you effects that are also uh, doing quite interesting things to your results, I'm sure. Yeah, I can certainly see us doing, still being in this space in 20 years' time, trying to work out um, exactly what's causing failures. We do want the results by, by 2050. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I see there's one question also online um, and this is from uh, Xiaoli Yang uh, and the question is whether it's possible to share some test data from comparative studies within era JP win or yeah What's that um, okay? so I guess it one of the challenges I think I've highlighted is um, most of the actual cable test data is quite uh, difficult to disseminate um, because it typically originates from a particular cable manufacturer. Um, and whoever that is, whatever happens is not usually beneficial to release it. So I think a program where you have at the outset the aim to disseminate um, is definitely worth doing, but the data that we have, we couldn't share. Um, so we're looking to have a, a something like a joint industry program for large scale testing, where everyone can learn and share the cost of the test as well. Uh, there is some good data from um, Exeter University on a number of tests, which gives us an idea of, of what might fail on, on some components, but it's not a big data set. Have you have you considered any sort of uh, possibilities to do testing where where yeah where it's not a commercial cable or if you could sort of I don't know uh, yeah make it available in one way or the other still uh, yeah, I think yeah it's a good point I think we're we're looking into options um, it's not particularly easy to, even if you only need five, 10 meters of cable, that it's not the easiest thing to um, put together. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So one more, uh, this is from, uh, I think it's Dutch, Fake Savenia. I'm sure I mispronounced your name, Frank uh, Fake, but uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I do the best I can. Uh, so, the question is, dear Will, thank you for the interesting presentation. How do you interface between the test setup and the real-time numerical model, your digital twin? Uh, so, it's not a hardware in the loop model, so we don't um, take the arm angles, for example, and feed that into the model. So, it's the model is, is run separately, um, where we just replicate the motion of the model. Um, I mean, if you've got a million and a half cycles, you don't necessarily need to run a million and a half cycles in your model. Uh, 10 will do. 
Um, so there won't be too much benefit in linking that together. I mean, you could do it with a Python script and certainly the, the script to get stresses in the armor wire is interfaced with a Python script in Orcaflex. Um, but there isn't too much benefit in this case in having a hardware in a loop model. Very good. Makes sense, I think. So, uh, any further questions? Uh, Paul, maybe you'd like to say a few uh, well chosen words to conclude the session. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear you, Paul? Okay. Uh, I was going to say, um, Will, you, you mentioned some of the uh, potential pitfalls. So you, you said you know, one of the issues is you, you don't know whether a cable's failed unless you, you cut it open. W were there any particular surprises that? that's come up in, in the research you've done so far? Anything you weren't expecting? Um, I think the, the, the issue, I can't, I can't really say too much, but certainly like amongst uh, the academic community and industry, there it is, it's not clear um, whether armor wire, you know, very simple, should be quite simple, which component's gonna fail first? Um, people predict the armor wire is going to fail first, but um, typically you see, to date, we've seen the copper cores fail first. So even something as simple as that um, has been surprising. Um, so I think there's a lot more, lot more to learn, but that, that's been the first thing that's jumped out. Okay. okay. I, I guess the, the, the other question I had, for you, Will, and actually not just for you, but for, for all of the speakers today, particularly the, the industry-related speakers, was, you know, are there any sort of trends coming from uh, the areas that, that the industry partners want to focus on? Because that, that, in effect, informs us as a research community, you know, effectively, where should we f focus our research in, 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 the, in the coming years? So do you want to start with that, Will? And, and maybe some, somebody others could answer as well? Yeah, I, I guess yeah, to me, I think it's um, on, on let's, let's get it down what we really need to know. So floating wind for me, um, properly characterizing the platform motions um, is pretty complex interface, particularly with fatigue. Um, it's very different fatigue profile to what you'd expect in something like oil and gas, um, where the fatigue profile is driven by weather or waves particularly, whereas for wind, it's a complex interaction between the winds, the turbine, the controller, and the hydrodynamics. Um, so understanding that, I think it will need to have some proper measurements on the, the coming fleet of demonstration arrays. Um, so that's going to be one of the biggest challenges. And then drilling down into, well, actually, how does your your mirroring behave, how does your cable really behave? Uh, so getting the basics right, I think, before we, we get too advanced will be the way to go. Yeah, be, before thousands of cables are out there, as you, as you said in yeah. your presentation. Yeah. Okay. And and Hannah, I don't know whether you, you, you're still online. You know, from the, the, uh, the program that you were presenting, you, you were saying that there was a big focus on technology so far, and you, you were just starting to get into other stuff. So from the technology side, are there any sort of le leading things coming out from the industry partners saying we need to look at this? Um, I think the, the two focus areas that we've seen both in the in phase three and continuing into, into kind of phase four and five, I mean, you saw I presented quite a lot on the kind of O&M strategy. So I think ensuring that kind of all those uh, the sort of additional services um, that yeah, that allow a wind farm to operate over its lifetime are, uh, are capable of meeting the needs of, of wind, uh, floating uh, wind technologies as they as they grow. And for that not to be a limiting factor, I think is uh, is really key. Um, I think making sure we've got the capacity both for the fabrication and uh, and uh, installation of 
uh, floating wind vessels and then also the capacity to then uh, maintain those in, in port facilities you know, if, if you're using a tow to port strategy I think understanding the kind of the requirements in different markets for uh, for port facilities I think is also also key um, and then I think kind of moving across to kind of our, our integrated program um, and some of the work we do in, in energy systems I think it's understanding the kind of the, the role within the whole system for offshore wind and, and floating offshore wind within that. Um, I think we, we did a, a report called Flexibility in, in Great Britain earlier this year, which looked at the role of flex, flexibility in uh, in meeting um, uh, meeting our net zero targets more cheaply. Um, and we saw across all of the scenarios a really important role for, for offshore wind. Um, it was deployed kind of you know, to the maximum we would allow it to uh, to be deployed in 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 the vast majority of the, the scenarios we ran, um, but it's just understanding how do we how do we do that and and what are the constraints from a kind of physical um, perspective of, of actually integrating that much wind onto the onto the system. Sure. Okay. And, and you you just got me thinking there actually that uh, floating wind is obviously an emerging technology, and then we're talking about potentially uh, converting wind to hydrogen on a floating platform. That's that's a lot of. <laughs> Well, emerging and immature <laughs> technologies there yeah yeah <laughs> yeah okay um and and then arvid hopefully you can hear me in amsterdam i, I was going to ask you what, what what struck me about your presentation was there was several floating platforms that that you 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 had um and i'm thinking in terms of convergence of those technologies do, do we have a feel for for what's going to happen there Bearing in mind that offshore wind is is uh, it's, it's settled on three bladed design, of course, horizontal horizontal axis. Um, do we do we still see floating platforms being four, five, six different designs in in ten years, or or, or do we see a convergence of that? Very interesting question. Uh, because uh, now we see they are going in very different uh, directions, and we also see new technologies in new, uh, who are different from the existing. For example, this uh, seat uh, vertical axis uh, uh, turbine, uh, and uh, we also see that uh, also related to to uh, we see upcoming uh, tension lag platforms, and so. But what? Uh, I guess that there will be uh, different technologies for different type of sea conditions and uh, seabed conditions. Uh, but it should be very interesting to, to see if uh, uh, how this will develop. Uh, and and I'm, I'm especially interested now to see this C12 vertical axis turbine because this is, uh, if, uh, the others are, are three-bladed turbines, but uh, this is quite different and it could be a disruptive technology. It has the, this uh, potential. Very yeah, it, it's fascinating. <laughs> okay, John, sorry, sorry back, back to you in, in Amsterdam. <laughs> 